Okay, so we start the trick with four, and the important thing is to remember the bottom card. Okay, just remember the bottom card. Okay, so four cards, and please commit to memory that bottom card. That's it. Okay, so for me, that's the seven of diamonds. That'd be weird if it was also true for some of you. Uh, I did use two decks after all, but you want to remember that bottom card. Okay, now the trick that I'm about to show you is called. Uh, baby Hummer, okay? It's due to a uh, sort of eccentric uh, mathemagician by the name of Charles Hummer, okay? In fact, he was just a straight up magician, uh, but he was also, uh, I don't know, he was probably on like the autism spectrum or something. He was known as being kind of a strange guy, but he came up with amazing tricks, um, and a lot of them had to do with what we would refer to, refer to as mathematicians as combinatorial, uh, uh, combinatorial, um, car, you know, card magic is what we would call it now. And essentially, there are certain things about ways that you shuffle cards that sometimes will preserve certain things within the deck itself. And a lot of them have to do with, you know, just playing on things like the suit or the number or what have you. And a lot of these tricks are fairly amazing, and there's more complicated versions of what I'm about to show you uh, that take advantage of the same, what we would say, invariance of the shuffle that I'm going to show you, okay? So again, four cards. Bottom card is the one that you need to remember. In my case, that's the seven of diamonds, all right? Okay, so then what you do, let me kind of put these down here in front uh, so that John can, can see what's going on pretty well. Okay, can you guys see what I'm doing here? I'm gonna make this bigger so everyone can see. Okay, I have my four cards, right? Got it? So the first thing I'm gonna do is, and, and look, remember, I'm not doing anything weird. There's the seven of diamonds, okay? The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the top card and put it on the bottom, okay? Got it? Yeah? Okay. See how many of you actually uh, do this right, okay? If everybody does it right, that, that'd be amazing. Next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take this top card and flip it over, okay? And then you're gonna do the following thing as many times as you want. And I'm gonna have no control over you whatsoever other than to tell you to just do this repeatedly, okay? So you take the top two cards, and you flip them. Top two cards and you flip them, okay? And then you give the pack a cut. And I don't care how many, how many you cut, it does not matter. Could be two cards, could be three cards, could be one card, okay? But you cut and you put them on the bottom, okay? So you cut them and put them on the bottom. I'm gonna take three and put them on the bottom, okay? It doesn't matter. And then you repeat that, that's called turn two and cut, T-tack. Turn two and cut, turn two and cut, turn two and cut, turn two and cut, turn two and cut. You can do it as many times as you want, okay? So turn two and cut. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna cut just one card this time. Turn two and cut, turn two and cut, turn two and cut, okay? Turn two and cut. I don't know, you can just do this as many times as you want. Turn two. Uh, and cut, and then you, and once you finish a cut, uh, you know, stop and, and kind of look up here at me for a minute, okay? All right? That's interesting, right? Okay? Well, hmm, now I have a sequence of things that I want you to do, right? So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to turn the top card over, okay? And then I want you to put that down on the bottom the way that it is. And then I want you to take the next card and just straight up put it on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, turn, turn it, yeah, just flip it, yeah. Yeah, okay. And now let's see if I can remember. Now, now finally flip the top card, flip the top card over, okay? There's exactly, if you did everything correctly, there's exactly one card that's, that's the opposite orientation of the others. 
there's exactly one card that's the opposite orientation of the others. And what should be true about that one card? It's your card, seven of diamonds. Yeah? Okay. All right. All right, should we do it one more time? Okay. Flip everything over. You can kind of mix them up, do whatever you want. Okay. Like this. Okay. And again, this is due to Charles Hummer. It's called Baby Hummer. And there's actually one called Royal Hummer, which some, some people call that Big Boy Hummer, right? And I'll kind of show you that at some point. That one is, I got to be honest with you, that one's a little scary. Uh, first time I did it, I was by myself at the, at the dining table at, at night. Everybody was in bed and I did it. And I mean, I got to tell you, there was something uh, spiritual happening there. It was... <laughs> And it wasn't good spiritual. I was like, holy smokes, uh, you know, some kind of dark forces at work here. But then I thought about it for a while and I was like, oh, math, that's the dark force at work. Uh, actually, it's, it's a force of light, right? Okay, so let's see here. I have my four cards. Remember, memorize the bottom card. For me, it's the queen of diamonds, okay? The queen of diamonds. Okay, and what do you guys remember? What do we do first? Well, okay, so first I just take the top card without doing anything and put it on the bottom. And I flip the top card over, okay? And then you start the turn two and cut, 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 right? You just do it that, do that as many times as you want. Turn two, cut, turn two, cut, Turn to cut, turn to cut, turn to cut, turn to cut, okay? Turn, turn to and cut, all right? And then do you guys, okay, I, I'm, I'm done. Now, then do you guys remember what we do? Flip the top card and move it to the bottom, okay? Take the next card and just straight up transfer that to the bottom without flipping. And the last card, you turn it. And at this point, it, there should be exactly one card that is the opposite orientation of the others, and it ought to be yours. Now, how many of you, how, how many of you did it, uh, did it work at least one time? Okay. How many of you did it work both times? And how many of you did it work at least one time? Okay, well, at least one time. Okay, good. Okay, so here, here's my challenge to you. Go to Chuck's or wherever it is you like to sit around and think about math and, uh, and figure out why this is working. Okay, if you can kind of figure out the principle at play here just by thinking about the way this shuffle is happening, this turn to and cut business, uh, it shouldn't be too hard, especially since there's only four cards here, to kind of think through why it is that this is happening, okay. all right? And if you need to uh, re-remember how we did this, you could go and, and watch this, this little video later on, okay? All right, that's cool. It's a nice way to start the day, okay? I'll show you a different one later on that's even more amazing, okay? So let me share my screen. Let's, let's get to it here. All right, I said last time that we are going to talk about quantifiers, okay? And again, this is a component of logic. Oh, oh before I get into this, I just wanna mention, um, I'm gonna start sending out emails like ask, uh, asking you guys to form little coalitions of yourselves, like maybe teams of size three or something uh, for future presentations. But on Friday, I will actually present, um, on Friday, I will actually present on another proof that Euclid gave. It's gonna be Euclid and the infinitude of the primes. That means, you ever wonder if there's an infinite number of primes or not? Uh, there are, there are an infinite number of primes. And Euclid actually gives a fairly clever proof in, in one of his books in the elements. 
um, he starts to kind of delve into number theory a little bit. So uh, I'll give you a little, little bit of history and, uh, and we'll talk about Euclid's proof of the infinitude of the primes, okay? All right, back to logic. So this guy, Charles Pierce, was very influential in formalizing logic very early on, okay? What we're looking at right now is formal logic. It's just trying to symbolize and formalize what we kind of know to be true intuitively, yeah? And in particular, he noticed pretty quickly that, uh, that there's a couple of, um, you know, intuitive ways that we think about uh, predicate logic, that is propositional functions that have variables involved. That there are things we tend to say that turn those kind of open sentences into propositions. And the way that we do it is with something called the universal quantifier. This is what the term he used. And the existential quantifier. Okay? We say things like for all or there exists. Okay? For all such things, something happens. Or there exists this thing such that this happens. Okay? And uh, before we move on, I want to ask you, so if I say for all, for all things, something happens, what does that sound like? Think about the two main logical connectives, namely and and or. If I say for all, which of those two, again, all logical statements are built on the back of and and or, yes? And as such, if I'm talking about universal and existential quantifiers, I'm not, I shouldn't be necessarily introducing something new. It all ought to come back to ands and ors. So if I say for all, does that seem to you more like and? Or does it seem to you more like or? And. And. That's right. I say for all, I'm saying give me any one of these things. This and this and this and this and this and this, all of them are true. Does that make sense? And if I say there exists, I'm talking about what? Or I'm saying one of these things is true, either this one or that one or that one or that one or that one, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay. So the existence is connected to the or logical connective. And for all, the universal quantifier is connected to and as a logical connective, okay? All right, let's look at an example using the universal quantifier. If P of X, and again, this is, an, this is a propositional function or an open sentence, okay? Because I don't know what the truth value of this is until, until I know what X is, does that make sense? If X is, Negative three, for instance, this statement would be false. Right? I'm saying X is bigger than zero. Does that make sense? So I would have to know what X is before evaluating the truth value. However, uh, by using these universal and existential quantifiers, I can actually turn this into a prop, I can actually turn it into a proposition that has a truth value without specifying a variable value. Okay, let's see how. Uh, so look, X, so for, again, what was the letter we used for all possible X values? What was the letter that we were using? You remember? It was U, and the reason we used that was because it, it made us think of the, the universe of all possible things I might try out in here, yeah? In this case, I'm thinking of the universe as the set of integers. So if P of X is simply the statement X is greater than zero, and I'm talking about integers, what truth value does for all x p of x have? Now, now I mean, just to, just to be clear here, for all x p of x, now what this means is, right, so this is logically equivalent to, look, I mean, like p of zero is in here, and p of one, and p of two, but also what else is in here? <laughs> p of negative one, 
and et cetera. Does that make sense? And remember, uh, we, kind of re we kind of wrote this in a funny way. We said like, and, and what I might do is I might actually put the, in, like, uh, and, and maybe I'll just put X, and it's understood that that X belongs to the integers, okay? And it's allowed to range over all possible integers. And then I might put P of X. So this is just, this is just an equivalent way of expressing this guy right here, okay? What is the truth value of that? What's that, what's the truth value of that thing? False, why, why is it false? Uh, X has to be greater than zero, and in order for this giant and statement to be true, all of these would have to be true. And excuse me, they're not. Give me an example of one that isn't. Uh, P of zero, for instance, P of negative one, that's false, right? I mean, there's lots of them, right? So this guy right here is false. This guy right here is false. Of course, these guys, you know, this one's true and that one's true, et cetera, but lots of them are false. For an and to be true, everything has to be true, yes? So let me ask you, do you see how using the for all, like and for all is this upside down A symbol, the for all universal quantifier turned this kind of vague open sentence into a proposition that we can evaluate the truth value of, yes? So we say for all X, and I don't even specify the universe just because we all are, have kind of agreed be beforehand what the universe is. We say for all X, P of X. That means what I'm saying in English is uh, for all integers, X, X is bigger than zero, yes? <laughs> I'm, I'm basically saying all integers are bigger than zero. False, right? If I were to say that in English, you would immediately reject that as being true. Yes, sir. Uh, well, that's a good question. What about the next one? There exists, let me ask you, if I said to you in common English, what I'm basically saying there is, there exists an integer that is bigger than zero. Is that true? Yes. Okay, to formalize that symbolically though, okay, to formalize that symbolically, uh, what is that? I, I said that the, their, the existential quantifier is a giant or, okay? So it's an or P of X, right? Which by the way, I mean, rewriting that, that's just, you know, da, 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 or, you know, P of negative one or P of zero or P of one or et cetera. Yes? And that is definitely, somebody already said it. That's definitely what? True, of course, this one up here, I didn't write it, but this one's false, okay? Does that make sense? So in English, in the first case, I'm saying there is a, or, or for, sorry, the first one I'm saying all integers are positive. How stupid, that's false. In the second case, I'm saying what? There is an integer that's positive. And we all say, yes, true, okay? So we just kind of formalize that in, in symbols here. Any questions on that? Okay, moving on. The egg, okay, again, this is, once again, just to kind of keep us all in the uh, straight and narrow here, this is for all, right? And, and of course, that's you use upside down A to remind you of A, yes? And uh, this is there exists. Okay? These two things have higher precedence than all the logical operators. Okay? All of them. Okay? The, uni the universal and existential quantifier have higher precedence than anything. Okay? So in the, if in the absence of any parentheses, okay, parentheses can always override uh, precedence, yes? You can always override precedence with parentheses. But in the absence of parentheses, for all and there exists would have a higher precedence, okay? All right. Okay, so work on this. 
work on this uh, there at your table with maybe your neighbor or something, translate that into predicate logic as an English sentence. And, I, and for this, I, I want you to imagine a universe, define a universe, yes? And again, a universe doesn't have to be numbers. It could be people, you know, it could be certain categories of people, what have you, yes? So define the universe, define the open sentence, and then write down, uh, you know, uh, write down a symbolic version of this, a formalized symbolic version of this statement, yeah? So think about that with people next to you. Okay. We'll reconvene in a couple minutes here. All right. What do you got? Yes. What's the universe? Everybody is every student in the class. Yeah, U equals uh, so students in this class. Oops. Okay. And we need a couple of open sentences. Okay, so someone want to tell me some open sentences? Like a, an open sentence is a statement that depends on a variable somehow, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so like maybe C of X is equal to the statement X has what? X has taken, well, well, what if we just say has taken calc? Okay. Because I can, I, can, I can make or with, uh, with just logic symbols, right? And so what about P of X? Yeah, so X has taken pre-calc. Okay, and now, so if, if this is the universe, you're saying, okay, this is every, okay. So which quantifier am I talking about here? For all, every student, X, what? No, I mean, this X, where does this X come from, Monique? No, 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 X comes from the universe. X, X is a student, right? Well, it's what interchange? So we, you just have to know where X lives. So this X, I mean, eventually, by the way, we might write something like this. We might write like X, and we'll, uh, like eventually we'll, uh, when we get into set theory, we'll write this, X in U. That means X has membership in that universe that we defined. But it's not necessary to write that in formal logic. It just becomes confusing. We all just agree that U represents the universe of things I'm considering. And when I talk about a variable, we just understand that that variable came from the universe. So where does X come from? The universe of, all, of the students in this class. Does that make sense? Okay. Make sense? Okay. Everything that you, everything that's in this universe has what property? What are we saying here? Uh, uh, well, every student, okay, we've already, we defined the universe to be students in this class, yes? So for every, what well, all this is saying right now is for, for every student in this class, yeah, what? C of X or P of X, yeah? Maybe they're taking calculus. Or pre calculus. So you would go C of X or P of X. Yes. Now that's that's one way to pull this off. Does, it, does that kind of make sense? I've just sort of formalized that sentence. For all X, and by the way, like I said, this uh, we will explain this, this notation later. That's kind of a set theoretic no notation that we'll explain later. Okay? You can if you want, yes. So what, what, and what did I say this means? Is a member of, 
X, it, this means is a member of, is a member of you. Okay, that's what that means. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, um, because what you're saying is, I mean, we, we, we applied the for all thing to X. Or, oh, and, oh, and what are you thinking? That that only applies to C of X or something? Oh, so you're thinking about going like this or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess you could if, if you felt like it was ambiguous. But yeah, that's true. Uh, but this thing wouldn't have a truth value if that for all only applied to the C of X. Does that make sense? Because in P of X, you'd be like, okay, well, what? Which X? Does that make sense? Um, so in, the, in this case, I would still assume that for all X applied to the entire OR statement, okay? All right, that's one way that you could do this. Here you did it by restricting the, the domain to students in this class. Does that make sense? You restricted the domain, the universe, to students in this class. Make sense? Now watch, there's another way you could do this, and I doubt, I'm not expecting you to have come up with this, but another way you could have done this is you could have defined you to be the set of all, all students. <laughs> all students. I don't know, at Cedarville University or something like that, okay? Okay, we could have said B of X, we could say B of X is X is in this class, because after all this class is called beautiful math, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I used B. What's C of X gonna be, do you think? X has taken Calc 1. Okay, and, and uh, one more, what was the other one we had? P of X, X has taken pre-calc, okay? Now, in this case, the universe has been expanded. Do you know what I'm saying? To include all students. So here I have to think carefully, I have to think carefully about which students specifically I'm talking about. So here what you would do, watch this, you would say, okay, for all X, for all X what? Okay, for all students, okay, being in this class implies what? <laughs> being in this class would imply what? You have taken calculus or pre-calculus. How would I symbolize that logically? B of X implies C of X or P of X, yes? So I would say B of X, so that means that student happens to be in this class, yes? And that would imply what? Yeah, C of X or P of X. Okay, and again, if you really want to make sure that it's clear that this for all X um, um, uh, applies to all of that. So this is a way that you could get away with expanding the universe and still say the same thing. Does that make sense? I'm still saying, what, uh, look, I'm only really, this, this, this logical statement only applies to students that happen to be where? In this class specifically, yeah? Okay. All right, questions on that? Sort of interesting. Yes, sir. Well, again, uh, okay, so, okay, so is this still a true statement? What if they're not in beautiful math? So what if I have a student who's not in beautiful math? Is that implication still true? So suppose I take someone who's not in beautiful math. B of X would be false. So the implication would still be true, yeah? And what I'm saying is, you know, this is still, this is still like a, a true statement, correct? I mean, and then if you're in beautiful math, 
you know, if, if my claim is that everybody in beautiful math is either taking pre-calc or calc, uh, those would be true as well. Like, you're in beautiful math, that's true, and then the other thing has to be true. I'm not, so, I don't, it doesn't seem like I'm addressing your question. So what's your, what, if you don't have the for all, then, then I would have to say specifically which, which X value I'm talking about. Does that make sense? The for all X means specifically that I'm actually making a statement about all students. All students, yes, that's what the for all X is saying. For all X, if you happen to be in beautiful math, what's true? For all students, if you happen to be in beautiful math, then what? X can't be false, it's a student. B of X could be false. Okay, well, right, well, because if B of X was false, what's automatically true about the, about the implication? It's true automatically, does that make sense? So if that thing's false, that thing is true automatically, okay? Yeah. Well, you wouldn't have any idea what the truth value was. If, if you, like if that for all X wasn't there, I would say B of X implies C of X or P of X and you'd be like, well, what's X? I don't know how to evaluate that. No, 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 but, but you wouldn't know what X was. You wouldn't know if it's a, if it's a student. I mean, you just, you wouldn't know what X was. Does that make sense? So you need to know what X is in order to evaluate the truth value. Okay. The for all X says, I'm making a statement about all students. Like it's a giant and statement. Yeah. Okay. I'm taking every possible student at Cedarville and I'm saying that all of these implications happen to be true. Okay. If you're not in beautiful math, well, that one's already true. If you're in beautiful math, then these two things. And I know some of you haven't taken Calc 1 before, okay? I know that. I know you're like maybe taking it right now, perhaps, yes? Um, but, but this is just for illustrative purposes, okay? Okay, other questions? The reason I did that is I want to show you there's not just one way to kind of write down the formal symbolic logic representation of a statement. It really depends on what the universe is that you define, yeah? If I define it to be students in this class, it looks much simpler. If I define it to be all students, I have to add a little caveat, yes? Namely, those are in beautiful, if you're in beautiful math, then this is true, yeah? Okay. Uh, okay, look, let's, uh, let's again, let's go back to the, four, the other definition. So you as students in what? Students in beautiful math, okay? We already know what C of X and, and P of X are, right? Here says some student, some student in this class has taken calc or pre-calc. So what would that be? There exists an X such that what? There is a student that's taken calculus and pre-calculus. Oh, was the last one or? That was, it was. Okay, so hopefully that was a true statement, right? You've either taken pre-calc or calculus. And this is saying, there is a student in this class that happens to have taken both of those, okay? Interesting, okay? There is a student in this class. So X, don't, don't like get hung up on the fact that X has to be a number, it doesn't. X could be Hannah, yes? I could literally say C of Hannah, and P of Hannah. Is that a true statement or not, Hannah? Have you taken Calc 1? Yeah. Have you taken pre, uh, hopefully you've taken pre-Calc, right? So this, this is actually true, right? Okay, so that would be equivalent to true. So don't get hung up on the fact that X has to be some kind of number, yeah? Okay. Yes. What does not for all x, p of x mean? Now remember, uh, behind, in the background is some kind of universe from which x is coming, yes? What does, 
they're, they're not, oh, oops, I'm, oh man, I'm starting to give this thing away, okay? Not for all x, p of x, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so the, the negation of the for all, so by the way, what is the for all? For all x, p of x, uh, that's like a giant, what is that? It's like a giant what? <laughs> and, right? So it's and x, p of x. And if I negate that, what's that going to be? So that's not, not, this giant and, and what do you think we could use? The Morgans, right? So this is equivalent to what? Or X, what? Not P of X, but what's that? This is the same thing, look, of giant or over the entire universe, that's just the existential. So that means that there exists x such that what? Such that not p of x is true, right? So what I'm saying is, look, we, we, at the beginning we said, what is the opposite of for all x p of x? Like what's the opposite of all of these things being true, okay? What is the opposite of all of these things being true? What is the opposite? Right? There being at least one, that's not true. Does that make sense? Yeah? What is the opposite, right? So what is the negation of all of these things being true? There existing one for which it's not true, yes? Think about that for a minute. And actually just kind of pushing through the symbols and using logical equivalences kind of dictated that automatically. We didn't even have to have intuition, but we do have intu intuition about it, yes? Okay, so it's like if I said, all students in this class have taken pre-calc. What's the opposite of that? There is a student who hasn't taken pre-calc. Does that make sense? That is exactly what's written here, yeah? And in fact, it, I even have P, like pre-calc, right? That's literally exactly what's written here. Amazing, questions on that? Oops, here we go. Uh, boy, let's not do that one. Uh, you can go kind of look at that. Uh, I'm gonna skip that one. It's, it's not too bad though, okay? Um, what is not there exists? Okay, so let's think about this. What is not the opposite of there exists x such that j of x, okay? So not there exists x such that j of x, okay? Think about that. What's the opposite of there existing one of these such that it's true? All of them are not true, yes? <laughs> so here I'm saying, what's the opposite of there is a student in here who's taken calculus. Like all students have not taken calculus. Does that make sense? All of the students in here have not taken calculus. So you're saying that this is the same thing as for all x what? Not j of x. And of course, if that, if that wasn't intuitively clear to you, what could I have done? Yeah, I could have said not. I could have written this as for all x, j of x. I could have used a Morgan's law, right? The negation of an or is an and, and then all of these things get negated. And then you say to yourself, I see there's a giant and, which is just for all x, yeah? For all x, not j of x, okay? Cool, right, questions on that? Hey, that's, that's sort of interesting. Oops, hey, that's the end of my slideshow, how about that? Uh, and hey, look, we're even a couple minutes early here. Uh, any questions? Any questions? We're gonna, we're gonna sort of see 
the universal and existential quantifier utilized later on to like make mathematical statements. Um, and eventually we'll even do some small proofs ourselves, right? I mean, I'm not gonna try to do the heavy lifting in this class, that's for Roper to do. Roper will just, uh, will just drill that into your cognition uh, like an ever-loving machine, okay? Uh, and it will be fantastic. But in here, I just wanna sort of introduce you to the logical underpinnings of why proof works the way that it does. But are there any questions? You guys see how De Morgan's is like a super important thing? It shows you how to negate really complicated logical statements. That's an important thing to be able to do. And my, my admonition to you is as you think through these symbolic logical statements, try to come up with examples that kind of give you intuition behind what's going on. Okay, that's kind of a helpful thing to do for sure. Okay, all right. Okay, so go figure out how to do or why baby Hummer is working. It'd be great.